Welcome to the Real News Network in Baltimore. I'm Kim Brown. For the first time, wind power capacity has just overtaken coal to become the EU's second largest form of power, according to new industry numbers. And nearly 90 percent of new power added to European electricity grids in 2016 came from renewable energy sources. As well, the rate of U.S. solar job growth has been 50 percent this last year, as reported by the U.S. Department of Energy, creating more jobs than the oil, gas and coal industries put together. Additionally, the falling cost of electric vehicles and solar technology could halt growth in global demand for oil and coal from 2020. A recent report co-authored by the Grantham Institute at Imperial College of London and the Carbon Tracker Initiative found challenging the wisdom of backing fossil fuel expansion. And with us to discuss if the future is indeed electric, we are joined by Luke Sussums. He is a senior researcher at the Carbon Tracker Initiative, which is a not-for-profit think tank in London, looking at how to align the global capital markets with the two degrees Celsius or less than climate outcome. He is also the lead author of the recent report, uh, Expect the Unexpected, which was produced with the Grantham Institute at Imperial College in London. Luke, we appreciate you joining us here on The Real News. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So first, let's talk about wind overtaking coal power in Europe in 2016. Is this an historic uh, outcome? And where are most of these wind turbines located? And who supported these endeavors? I mean, it's a really exciting time for renewable energy as a whole uh, in the EU. Uh, it's definitely a significant moment in time, but it's just a one, one marker of many which are to come. Uh, the costs of wind power in the, in the region are falling, is the same as happening for solar PV in the EU. Um, and so actually, our, it's our contention that actually renewable energy will continue to grow uh, in the EU, EU and globally. Because the report that we produced with the Grantham Institute at Imperial College actually shows solar PV and wind power really spreading quite fast across the world now that costs have come down to, to the degree that they have. So let's turn to the subject of your report, because you say with the dropping of cost of renewable energy, global demand for oil and coal could halt from 2020. But yet in the U.S., with the new administration that we have here, we see a real or re-entrenchment uh, with bolstering the fossil fuel infrastructure. So talk about the concept of, quote, stranded assets that your organization, Carbon Tracker, really put on the map. Yeah, exactly. We coined uh, the term stranded assets to mean those fossil fuel um, assets, whether or not they're, they're power plants or their refineries or their pipelines, those that really aren't necessary anymore in the world that we are undergoing an, in a low carbon transition. Now, a lot of what Mr. Trump is saying doesn't really make a lot of economic sense. For example, he's vowed to bring back the coal industry in the U.S., when actually the reason for its collapse was that natural gas and renewable energies simply outcompeted coal. They became cheaper and the preferred source of power. Now, Trump has also uh, approved a couple of pipelines. He's approved the Keystone XL pipeline. He's approved also the Dakota Access pipeline. But what he hasn't really thought through is that actually this will bring more oil to the market, which is already oversupplied. And our report actually goes on to talk about how EVs and their growth in the future could serve to reduce demand even more for that product. So the imbalance in the market will just cause the price to potentially collapse. So, Luke, I mean, could it get to the point in the future where certain economies would boom due to investments and support for renewable energy, as we're seeing the Chinese government do, uh, and those left behind will be forced to follow suit due to market forces? I think that's certainly the case. I mean, China is really setting out its stall to become the leader in low carbon technologies in the future. It's already the production center for solar PV, and it had this ripple effect to cause the whole technology to be cheaper around the world. Now, they're also planning on doing exactly the same thing with electric vehicles. Again, we anticipate that this ripple effect could occur where electric vehicles as a result become so much cheaper around the world because China is planning on building a hell of a lot of these things. So they're certainly looking to lead in this regard, but I think the rest of the rest of the world will actually follow suit. So discuss the models that you used for your study. Was there a pathway that described a, a, a complete transition to renewable energy, for example? 
Yeah, so we worked with the Grantham Institute at Imperial College, and they have a global energy system model. Now, that models all sectors of energy consumption around the world. Now, we looked at just what happens if solar PV and electric vehicles grow really rapidly. So although we're actually looking at just these sectors in particular, just the power and the road transport sectors, we actually saw that demand for coal, oil and gas and subsequent CO2 emissions were actually curbed really, really significantly. However, we didn't actually manage with through our modeling to still achieve a two degrees outcome, which is, as many know, the internationally uh, agreed target for m limiting levels of global warming. So what this really means is that although decarbonization of the power and road transport sectors can get us a really long way towards that target, we also need to decarbonize other sectors too, such as heavy industry or other forms of transport like aviation or shipping. So both nuclear energy and carbon capture and sequestration are technologies surrounded by controversy, the latter not yet considered a proven technology. So were these also part of your modeling towards uh, a, a carbon intense future? Yeah, I mean, our report was really quite damning for the potential of carbon capture and storage. Um, by the time, in our scenarios, by the time that carbon capture and storage actually becomes cost competitive with alternatives in the power sector, so have so many other technologies. So we actually see a bit of an uptake for a technology called bioenergy with CCS. Now, that's a technology that actually takes emissions out of the atmosphere. So it's a net negative emissions technology. Now, many people don't think that's cost competitive for a number of decades, but it's really a damning statement that that becomes more cost competitive than CCS in our modeling. Um, nuclear does, does quite well in our scenarios because it has such a long, time, uh, long lifetime for nuclear power plants that, that over that lifetime, the cost of the technology is actually quite good. Indeed, and renewable energy storage has long been a challenge for transition away from fossil fuels. For instance, in less sunny climates or because of the intermittence of the wind, has this issue been solved with new forms of batteries developed by Tesla or others? Yeah, I mean, the data points that companies, as you say, like Tesla or General Motors or a number of European car manufacturers are coming out with are incredibly ambitious. They are so far ahead of what inst uh, forecasting institutions actually thought was possible. So as you say, that serves to be a real benefit for the power sector going forward and the potential penetration of renewable energy technologies. Now, in our scenarios, we actually factor in the costs of required levels of energy storage and still renewables are still the far more competitive option in the global power grid out to 2050. So are electric cars an existential threat for big oil, in your opinion? I mean, they can certainly serve to curb future oil demand. Um, we actually see up to 25 million barrels a day of oil being displaced by EVs by 2050. Now, to put that in context, at the moment, the world consumes around 96 million barrels per day. So it's more than a quarter of current levels of consumption. That's a significant amount of demand that potentially oil and gas companies think is going to be there, but actually doesn't turn out to materialize. And yet the oil war seems to be ramping up between the U.S. and OPEC, and some would argue that the industry is rebounding with oil between 50 to $60 a barrel. So there are now 712 active oil and gas rigs in the United States, which is 93 rigs above the rig count a year ago, according to oilprice.com and services provider Baker Hughes. And construction may begin any day with the last leg of the controversial Dakota Access Pipeline, and President Trump also issued an executive order to build the Keystone XL pipeline. So could all of these become stranded assets potentially? I mean, I think that's certainly a possibility. I mean, as I mentioned, if you have the if you have simultaneous effects where electric vehicles serve to constrain oil demand growth in the future and you have, as you mentioned, pipelines such as Keystone XL and Dakota Access bringing more oil to market, it serves to really accentuate what's already an oversupplied balance in the oil market. Now, that was served to, um, to lower oil prices going forward. This is largely what some of the companies themselves are even admitting. So BP in their latest energy outlook actually said there's far more oil reserves and resources out there than are possibly going to be needed to 2050. 
It's an indication of the oversupply that's inherent in, in the oil markets at the moment. Even the IEA just last week came out and said that they see little reason to believe the oil price will uplift in the near future. Indeed, we have been speaking with Luke Sussums. He is a senior researcher at the Carbon Tracker Initiative, which is a not-for-profit think tank in London. We've been discussing how renewable energy has accounted for more power used by the European Union than fossil fuels This for the first time ever. So, Luke, we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. And thanks for watching The Real News Network.